In the face of the crushing onslaught of German panzer power and their big cats, the United States took a gamble engineering a new breed of armored combatant, the tank destroyer. This machine sacrificed armor for blistering speed and agility. The stakes were the lives of American soldiers like Norbert Gerling thrust into war with the pioneering 609th Tank Destroyer Battalion and the revolutionary M18 Hellcats. Gerling's mission was to test the Hellcat's effectiveness in shoot-and-scoot tactics. This meant proving these nimble, lighter war machines could swiftly outmaneuver and launch precise, damaging strikes against the bulky German tanks. The Hellcats would hit hard and disappear swiftly, leaving the enemy disoriented and unable to strike back. But hunting down the heaviest, most potent combat vehicles on Earth was a task that would push man and machine to their limits. On March 7, 1945, Gerling and his crew faced an impossible mission, rescuing a U.S. tank crew trapped in a ravine. Their tank incapacitated, shadowed under an overpass by the very anti-tank gun that had crippled them. Gerling was acutely aware of the razor's edge they walked on. If their Hellcat paused momentarily, they'd be sitting ducks for the enemy's guns. But if they charged at full throttle, obliterated the overpass's pillars, and crashed it down on the German gunners before they could react, maybe, just maybe, they could pull off the most audacious shoot and scoot of the entire war. As the war dragged into its third year, the Allies were haunted by the looming specter of Germany's colossal and technologically superior tank forces. The introduction of the gargantuan Tiger I in 1942 sent shockwaves through the Allied ranks. This behemoth, a rolling fortress of destruction, effortlessly crushed anything in its path. Tipping the scales at a monstrous 54 tons, the Tiger was a predator to all its contemporaries. Its crown jewel, the 88mm KWK-36 gun, could annihilate any mass-produced Allied tank from a staggering distance of 3,600 yards. Sherman tanks were obliterated well before they could even get in range to retaliate. Clad in armor as thick as fortress walls, the Tiger was virtually impervious to most Allied anti-tank rounds, transforming it into a near-invincible juggernaut on the battlefield. This induced a paralyzing terror in the heads of Allied tank crews, who saw the shadow of a Tiger in every German tank they faced. In response to the German Blitzkrieg's mechanized onslaught, 1942 saw the birth of the U.S. Tank Destroyer Doctrine. It pivoted on marshalling anti-tank weapons into battalions at divisional levels or higher, amassing these forces into formidable groups when needed. This strategy traded armor for mobility and firepower, envisioning tank destroyers not as impregnable fortresses, but as swift, lethal hunters, shielded just enough to shrug off small arms fire while they zeroed in on their enemy. Tank destroyer crews were the embodiment of aggression and elitism, trained to shatter the psychological dominance of tanks on the battlefield. Their creed, seek, strike, and destroy, was not just a motto, but a war cry, urging these units to seize the initiative and aggressively hunt their prey. This need spurred the evolution of American tank destroyer vehicles. Initially, makeshift solutions like the M3 gun motor carriage and the M6 GMC cobbled anti-tank guns onto existing vehicle frames. However, as the war's cruel reality set in, these rudimentary models showed their limitations, paving the way for more specialized beasts of war. Then came the M10 Wolverine, a pivotal chapter in the evolution. Born from the Tank Destroyer Tactical and Firing Center work in 1941, the M10, a spawn of the modified Sherman tank chassis, boasted a 3-inch gun on a rotating turret. This innovative design tackled the earlier model's flaws and became a mainstay in the conflict. As the war continued, the Allies were up against the wall with Germany's heavy-hitting tanks. The M18 Hellcat was their Hail Mary, built for speed to run circles around the German Titans. Buick was tapped to roll out this top-of-the-line tank destroyer. Factories were overhauled, and assembly lines rejigged at lightning speed to churn out Hellcats. This was no easy feat. Many of the Hellcat's parts were custom-made specifically to meet the tough demands of the military. This beast weighed in at least 20 tons, a good five times lighter than the Panzer IV, and its armor was thin as paper compared to the Panzer's heavy-duty steel. Originally, the Hellcat was supposed to have a diesel engine, tough as nails and reliable. But time was of the essence, so they switched gears to a gasoline engine to speed up production and pump out more destroyers before the war's curtain call. Buick's engineers put in a torsion bar suspension, making the Hellcat smooth as silk and quick as a hiccup, hitting speeds over 40 miles per hour. Its powerhouse was a 9-cylinder, 450-horsepower aircraft engine with a robust 3-speed, 900T torquematic transmission. Armed first with a 37mm cannon, the Hellcat was a force to be reckoned with. But as the Germans beefed up their armor, the Hellcat upped its game to a 57mm cannon, and finally a 75mm cannon by war's end. 
This cannon could knock the socks off tanks like the Panther and Tiger I, which were big and slow as molasses. The Hellcat's ace in the hole was its speed. Less armor meant it could zip around those heavy tanks, remaining the fastest tank in the U.S. arsenal until the M1 Abrams came along. She had an open-top turret, and alongside the Sherman-based M10 and the M36, loaded with a 90mm gun, the Hellcat rolled into every theater in Europe and the Pacific. With a cannon that could punch through 140 millimeters of armor and speed that left the enemy in the dust, the Hellcat was set to turn the tide in tank warfare. Still, the Hellcat wasn't bulletproof. It had its share of issues with penetrating the armor of the big German tanks like the Panther and Tiger. Plus, its skimpy armor and the tight squeeze in the turret were real headaches for the crew. But Hellcat crews weren't ones to throw in the towel. They played to their strengths, using speed for sneaky flanking moves and aiming for the chinks in the enemy's armor. The Army's Tank Destroyer Center rolled the dice and shipped a couple of trial M18 Hellcats to the 601st Tank Destroyer Battalion and another trio to the 894th at the Anzio Beachhead. But the 894th balked when they got a good look at these new war machines. Their thin skin made them easy fare in a toe-to-toe -to -toe scrap with German tanks, so they ended up assigned to reconnaissance units instead. In the brass's eyes, the Hellcats were a risky bet. Commanders feared their crews would be easily chewed up by enemy panzers. By the fall of 1944, after combing through field reports from the tank destroyer battalions, the Army called for some upgrades to the M18. They wanted turret covers, coaxial machine guns, muzzle brakes, and beefier shock absorbers. As the months passed, the Army was still hesitant regarding the M18 due to its thin skin, even though speed over armor was the whole point of the tank destroyer concept. In August 1944, they figured slapping on an extra ton of armor wouldn't put too much drag on her speed and agility. They developed a kit to drastically improve the turret armor, but dragged their feet on retrofitting the Hellcats already in the field. When D-Day hit on June 6, 1944, there were only 30 tank destroyer battalions in Europe. The M18 units finally jumped into the fray in late July, tagging along with Patton's 3rd Army in Operation Cobra. Patton was gunning to bust through the gap in the German lines that Lieutenant General Courtney Hodge's 1st Army had pried open. But in their first month on the front lines, the M18s hardly saw any real tank-knocking action. Instead, they got roped into jobs they weren't built for. They were babysitting motorized supply lines and giving the infantry a hand with direct fire support. In mid-September 1944, the 4th Armored Division, spearheading General George Patton's thrust through Lorraine in eastern France toward the Tsar River, first employed the M18 Hellcat tank destroyers in a major engagement against the formidable German Mark V Panzer. The American crews quickly grasped that engaging a Panzer at long range with their 76mm guns was futile due to the Panzer's thick armor. To take down a Panzer, an M18 had to maneuver within 300 yards to breach the mantlet, the armored plate on the Panzer's 75mm cannon. During this period, the Hellcat units clashed with several Panzer battlegroups. Post-battle reports credited the M18s with destroying 39 Panzers, sacrificing only four of their own. In this baptism of fire, the Hellcats demonstrated their effectiveness. The Hellcat became a linchpin in countering German armored thrusts, a task challenging for infantry due to the intensity and rapidity of German attacks. With multiple tank destroyers, the Allies could outflank and outmaneuver enemy armor, exploiting weak points and thwarting the Germans' ability to deliver crushing blows against Allied infantry. As they blazed across Europe, Hellcat crews discovered their ability to traverse the battlefield rapidly and engage enemy tanks with lethal efficiency. In response, the Germans continually up-armored their tanks, trading mobility for near-impregnable defenses, prompting the Americans to upgun their armaments. On the battlefield, the Hellcats' hit-and-run tactics sowed confusion and hindered German offensives. During the Battle of the Bulge, on December 19th and 20th, the 10th Armored Division, defending Novia, collaborated with paratroopers to assail the 2nd Panzer Division. The 1st Battalion, augmented by M18 Hellcats, destroyed 30 enemy tanks and inflicted between 500 and 1,000 casualties. The M18 speed made them formidable, but their light armor rendered them vulnerable if unable to swiftly disengage from enemy fire. They were the World War II armor's glass cannons, swift, agile, and devastating, yet perilously exposed if stationary for too long. A standout battle for the M18 Hellcat occurred near Aracourt, France, on September 19, 1944. Commanding the 704th Tank Destroyer Battalion, Lieutenant Edwin Leeper discerned an enemy tank muzzle in the fog. Leeper's unit swiftly neutralized five German tanks from the 113th Panzer Brigade, losing only one destroyer in the initial five minutes of engagement. The Hellcat's unmatched speed gave them an edge over the slower German tanks, presenting the Germans with critical tactical dilemmas. 
Sergeant Henry Hartman, commanding a single M18, exemplified the Hellcat's potency by destroying six German tanks, showcasing the fearsome capability of these weapons when expertly wielded in combat. As 1945 dawned, marking the waning days of World War II, American tank crews mastered the art of war with their M18 Hellcats, recognizing them as instruments of swift destruction. They understood the Hellcat's Achilles' heel, vulnerability when static. Yet in motion, these machines were relentless predators, leveraging unparalleled speed, agility, and firepower. The 609th Battalion moved into combat on September 20, 1944, after storming ashore at Utah Beach in France. They plunged into the thick of hellfire, with tank crewman Norbert Gerling vividly recalling the relentless battles, particularly in the blood-soaked French village of Saint-Lô, where they squared off against the Third Reich's dreaded German Tigers. He recalled a harrowing rescue mission that tested their mettle. Quote, There was one of our tanks sitting right in the middle of this valley, and it had been disabled to the point that they couldn't fire their gun or anything. Inside, the crew was trapped, pinned down by a lurking German anti-tank gun, cunningly concealed under an overpass, its barrels trained down from a dominating hill. Gerling's unit, armed with four Hellcats, made a daring decision to storm the valley in a unified do-or-die charge. They knew they wouldn't survive a one-by-one -one approach under the methodical aim of the German gun. Like a cavalry charge of old, the Hellcats tore through the valley, where stopping meant certain destruction. Gerling, serving as a gunner, spotted two of the three supports for the overpass. He knew a precise shot could collapse the structure onto the German artillery. As the German guns roared to life, spewing lethal fire toward the charging Hellcats, Gerling zeroed in. Shells erupted behind them, throwing curtains of earth skyward, a hair's breadth from annihilation. He needed just a heartbeat to align the fatal blow. Quote, I fired seven or eight rounds. I hit the two pedestals that I could see through the scope, and the overpass collapsed onto the German gun, neutralizing the threat. The mission was a monumental triumph. The Hellcat squadron not only took down the enemy weapon, but also rescued the besieged American crew. For his valor and quick thinking in the rescue on July 5, 1945, Gerling was decorated with the Bronze Star Medal. Having navigated an odyssey of 1,200 miles across Europe's ravaged landscapes, fighting tooth and nail in his Hellcat, Gerling asserts that this rescue, a beacon of hope amidst relentless warfare, remains his most searing memory as a Hellcat gunner. <laughs>